morning. I was coming out of the coffee shop, got a great group of men to meet with every Wednesday morning at 5.30. I was on my, down here to get some coffee. I was on my way out, and a guy that I hadn't seen in a long time had just pulled up into the parking lot, and he was on his way in. have known him for years, like probably, I think, since the first year we moved here. Our kids were about the same age, and uh, he had a son, and I had a son that were both playing, and now he's going to crank it up again. That's all right. <laughs> they were both playing on the same uh, junior pro football team. And so in the years since then, I've seen him in lots of, like at the grocery store and school events. And I don't know, we just made a connection. And now every time we see each other out and about, we will stop whatever we're doing and try to get caught up a little bit. And uh, he had this kind of, you ever seen somebody and they, they just look like the weight of the world's on their shoulders? He had that kind of a look. And um, I really had somewhere else I needed to be, but I needed to be where he was at that moment. And I don't think it was just coincidence that our paths crossed. So he was filling me in on what's been going on. He said, you know, um, it's been three years since my wife left me for another man. And he was still struggling a lot with that. And so he started talking about really the stuff that probably anybody who's been divorced has experienced to some degree or another if there's kids involved. The tension that they continue to deal with as they're working out custody battles issues and all that and they hadn't made the wisest of decisions when they were married like financially and so he's like very unstable in that room because they're still trying to clean up some very big messes that were made uh, in all those years that they were together and uh, I, he didn't really need me to say anything he just needed somebody to listen and I, I think that sometimes the greatest ministry that we can give to other people is just saying you know uh, I'm going to care enough to stop what I'm doing and get, be an ear for you. Because somehow in that, I think that they get that God cares about them too. So he's talking and I'm just listening. His son's like, I need to go get coffee. I'm going to order. And so his dad tells him his order and he goes inside. And uh, when, the, when the boy got inside the coffee shop, then he started this line of conversation. I know that it's really like detrimental for me to ever say anything bad about the kid's mom especially for them, Amen. but I'm really struggling here. And I thought, man, that's an honest, that's an honest, that's honest. Amen. You know, sometimes it's not easy to find something good to say about someone, but he knows that I, I can't do that because it will be a detriment to them and to her, and I just don't want to live that way. About that time, his kid came back out because he didn't have the money, and he takes out his thing, gives it to him, he goes back in, and, and he keeps talking. Towards the end of the conversation, he said, you know, I know that my kids... And a whole lot of other people that are around me are watching to see how I handle all of this. And the reason they're watching is because they know I'm a Christian. And I was kind of blown away by that. I'm like, man, this is a, a, an opportunity or a place in life where a lot of folks would probably just hone in on what's going on with me. And he had the good sense or maybe the good spirit to be aware that everything that he did had an impact on everybody else who was around him. So we talked for a few more minutes, and I did my best to try to encourage him. His coffee was in there getting cold, so he went his way, and I went mine. I, I think that all of us would agree this morning. In fact, if you agree, get ready to say amen. I'm going to give you a couple places to say amen this, this today that's going to be really easy for you, okay? If you agree with this statement, say amen. Behavior matters. Amen. I think we would all agree with that. A wife's behavior matters to her husband. A husband's behavior matters to his wife. Parents' behavior matters to their kids. Amen. And if you're a parent that's worth two cents, you'll say that your kids' behavior matters too. Yes. Everybody that's uh, in, in the field of education, it's two different conversations, like whether you can really do anything about it or not. That's another issue altogether. But every teacher that I know say that students' behavior matters. And Gogan, the NFL says Tom Brady's behavior matters, even if the judge says no. Amen. That one was just for you, Mike. Sarah Hicks, where are you at? Sarah Hicks, and you guys don't, you may not know about this, but your older daughter, Amanda, who's now in Colorado, and Kay Duffendahl will all tell you that the state trooper between here and Nashville on I-24 will say, behavior matters. Because he said it to all three of them, and I'm pretty sure that's what he said to me when he got me too. <laughs> Behavior matters. But don't be mistaken. The Christian faith is not about behavior modification. 
When we turn it into that, it's something other than what God intended it to be. Amen. What the Christian faith about is a relationship with God that so transforms us on the inside that what happens on the outside is different than it used to be. Yes. The behavior change follows the heart change. Yes. And God's big picture plan, what his desire is, is to make us like Jesus. He wants to make us holy, sanctify is the word we're going to see in the scripture. And at the end of the day, that is God's biggest desire for all of us to restore, to restore what was busted up by sin. Amen. And as that happens, the, the, the hope is that all, for all of us, we start to look more like Jesus today than we did yesterday. But it's not as much as we will tomorrow because he's still working on us. So... Uh, that's what we're going to talk about today, but I need to, I'm going to contextualize this two different ways. One, in the, uh, I need to contextualize it in our whole series we've been doing. So August, we started this called series. And so the, you've had the same image now for a couple months on called. We talked about being called to follow Jesus, the story of Philip in John 1. We talked about called to community out of Acts 2, that this isn't a solo thing. When God hooks us up with him, we instantly get connected with our brothers and sisters and God intended this life to be lived in the context of a community of faith that happens to be called church. The week, week, third week, we talked about the call to serve. And you know we see it around here all the time. It's, our, it's in our logo, the basin and towel. As Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Then the last two weeks leading into today, and then there's going to be one more, we've been talking about this call to holiness. So the first week of that was out of Romans 6. Remember we talked about how uh, we, we've got one of two masters. And Paul says that whenever we, we, are, we were baptized into Christ, we were buried with him in his death, we were raised up with him into new life, into resurrection living, so that sin does not have to be our master anymore. The holy life is living the life with Jesus as it, the sole leader of our life. Last week we talked about holiness in terms of selflessness. As we were lowered down into that pit, remember that, with the... Uh, that prison cell with the Apostle Paul who at a point where he could have been totally concerned and consumed with himself, his concern, he remember, Dear Timothy, I've been thinking about me. No, that's not what he said. I've been thinking about you. And today we hit this, and it really runs cover to cover in the scripture, the call to be a holy people. We're going to look at it from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So go ahead and turn there with me, but I'm not going to read it yet. You can go ahead and find your spot. So the first way, I want to contextualize it and where we're at and where we're headed. We're going to be in uh, chapter 5 next week. But um, in order for us not to misread this, we got to kind of get our mind wrapped around some context here. Have y'all ever been in one of those conversations where you only heard part of it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Amen. And you thought it was really all about this, but yet when you heard the big picture, well, it was really about this over here, right? Yes. If we're not careful, we can do that scripturally. If we don't see the big picture of what's going on, we can get off track a little bit. So I'm going to give you some context stuff that will help you know how to hear this. For one, Paul's writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica. This is not an open letter to the community of Thessalonica. It is written very specifically to the church. These are people who, like you and me, most all of us, at some point had had an encounter with Jesus. Now, this is a young church. They're very young in the faith. They're trying to figure it all out. But what they do know is the life we used to live apart from Christ has now been radically rearranged because we've experienced the forgiveness that only he can bring. And it's all, it's a whole new ball game now. The reason that that's important is because there's nowhere really, I don't think anywhere that I've found in scripture where in any of the letters, the apostle says, tell the world this is how they're supposed to behave. That's not what happens. The issue is, tell the church how godly people are supposed to behave because they're trying to figure out what it means to live a godly life. And those are two very different things. The church gets in trouble. We got enough on our hands trying to figure out how we're supposed to be living it right. Amen. Without using a scripture that the rest of the world doesn't even recognize as authoritative trying to tell them how to behave. So this is a letter to the church. Are you tracking with me? There's a history here. Second thing is there's a history. Paul has been to Thessalonica. And we're going to, you can see in chapter 1, he says, um, you saw the life that I lived whenever I was with you. You got what I taught you. So what happens in the letter is Paul is just putting on paper what he's already told him in person by way of reminder in, in one sense, by way of continuing the teaching in another. 
So, written to the church, they've got a relationship, and his expectation is, when they read this, they're going to know who it's from. They're going to receive it as not only authoritative, but as helpful. The third thing is, the Christian faith is not an idea to debate. Yes. It is a life to be lived. Amen. So, this is not pie in the sky philosophy, it's not theoretical, it's not in the realm of possibility. What we're talking about here is very practical, where the rubber meets the road, you want to live a holy life, this is what it looks like stuff in the real nitty gritty of earth. A real word for a real world. That's what we got here. So the expectation is not that they're going to sit around, you know, uh, debating it for hours upon hours, but that they're going to receive it, they're going to put it into practice, and they're going to live like it. Okay? A couple more things you need to know. Paul assumes that the intent of the people that are going to read that is to please God. And I got to tell you guys, that's the assumption that I come with here every Sunday. When I stand up here and say, this is what God told me to say to y'all, I I do it with the expectation that you want to hear it because you want to live it. Now, if, if not, you find somewhere else to be. There's lots of stuff to do on a Sunday. Pretty day out there. My assumption is that you're here is because you, you want to know God. You want to know him better. Is that a safe assumption? Yes. Okay, the last one. The last one we've got to keep in mind here is that when Paul talks about behavior, he's really laying it out there in a way that we're going to look at and probably say, and to some extent, that's impossible. But Paul assumes that everything we need to live a godly life, God's given it. That the same spirit, I love this, that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is alive and well in us, giving us the power to be everything God wants us to be and to do everything God wants us to do. So when Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, he's writing with the assumption that everything they need, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, they've got it. Mm -hmm. So that sets the table. You all tracking with me? Everybody good? So we enter 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you found your spot, go ahead and stand. And we're going to read the first 12 verses. Um... I'm reading out of the NRSV today. Finally, brothers and sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you learn from us how you ought to live and how to please God, as in fact you're doing, you should do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now, not a word you see all the time, right? Amen. Big word, maybe complicated. Let me simplify it for you. If you want to know what God's will for your life is, there it is in one word, sanctification. It can also be translated holiness. This isn't just a, you know, holy people are like the 90-year-old lady who prays 23 hours out of 24. This is God's expectation for all of us. That we be sanctified, set apart, consecrated, completely devoted to God, to the God who has revealed himself to be devoted to us. It's about looking like Jesus. If you want to know what a picture of holiness is, look at Jesus. That's what it is. And that's what God wants to do in us. This is God's will for you, your sanctification. Now we start getting into the behavior stuff. That you should abstain from fornication, that each one of you should know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. Just as we have already told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this word is not human authority, but God. Who also gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning love of brothers and sisters, you don't need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God how to love one another, and you do love all the brothers and sisters throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, beloved, to do it more. Do it more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs. In other words, keep your nose out of everybody else's business. To work with your hands as we directed you, so that you may behave properly toward outsiders. In some translations it'll say so that you may gain the respect of outsiders and be dependent on no one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Okay, so I love how practical Paul is. He just jumps right in there with stuff that would typically make people feel uncomfortable, but when you love people, you'll have uncomfortable conversations, right? Right, right, right. So this morning we're going to talk about sex, at least for a little while. 
And some people are blushing and some are looking down and like, did he really say that in the sanctuary? Yes, he did. Yeah. Why? Because that's where the word takes us. And we go wherever scripture takes us. Paul says, this is God's will for you. That whatever you do with your bodies reflects holiness and honor. Amen. Behavior matters. Yeah. And specifically, sexual behavior matters. Mm -hmm. I love that this walk with Jesus is not, it's not for another world. Amen. It's for this world. Amen. It's for the one we live in, where we live and move and have our being. It's, it's for right now in a culture like ours. Now our culture is a little bit different than the first century. 21st century, first century, at the end of the day, people are people, right? Yeah. But there were some differences. The water that these guys were swimming in was, was kind of murky. These are, again, brand new believers, young in the faith. For the most part, this is first generation Christian stuff. They don't have a history like we do of looking at how the church dealt with this, that, and the other. They're, they're on the front end of all of this. But here's what would, life would look like in first uh, century Thessalonica. If you were a man, you could do about whatever you wanted. If you were a woman, not so much. Here was the norm, the social norm. Let's say a guy is married, he's got a wife, and here's her job. Uh, it is to, is to take care of the legitimate children and to run the household. If he was wealthy enough to have a slave that was a female, nine times out of ten, that female doubled as his concubine. Socially acceptable. In addition to that, it was like, um, it was like life in Vegas where prostitution is legal. The social mores of the day was that, well, men are going to be men, and that's what they do. And so you can have a wife, a concubine, and you can have some prostitutes as long as you don't do, have too many of them. But the socially acceptable practice was all kinds of sex before and beyond marriage. That was a social norm. Sound familiar? We might have other ways that our sexuality is being discussed and practiced and, uh, and prohibited or whatever. But the message in 1 Thessalonians 4 is real simple. What we do with our bodies matters. Amen. And in the church sometimes what we can do is, is build, we can, we can draw our, our legalistic line around sexuality and se that says, and this is the line that the scripture draws. One man, one woman in matrimony, period. Anything outside of that, the scripture has a word for it. I'm not making this up. Your beef's not with me. I'm just telling you what's in it. Anything outside of that is defined as sexual immorality. Anything outside of that. But here's what we can do in the church if we're not careful. We can beat that drum of sexual morality and all the while be dishonoring what the scripture says the rule, the expectation for how our sexuality is lived out is, is, is there's, there's two different qualifying words, holy and honorable. And I do enough work with couples to know that you can be in a heterosexual marriage and not be having sex outside of that relationship and still not have holy and honorable sexual activity as you honor God with your body. Because here's the deal, lady, and I know we got kids in here, they're old enough. You haven't talked to him yet, you better start because somebody else is doing it already. I promise you that. You cannot dishonor your spouse by treating them as an object and believe that you're honoring God because you're keeping the rule. What kind of sex? Sex is a gift. God gave it to us. And it is awesome when it is holy and it is honorable. And I'm telling you, I love this scripture because it's right where we live, right? It's right where we, that's where I want to live. Sure, I want to, yes, we want to live there. Now, to the world, this doesn't make any sense at all. But you got to keep in mind that what Paul is concerned with here is not the social norm. He's not concerned with sociology, he's concerned with theology. And here's, here's why I say that. His biggest question, his point of reference, what everything else is oriented around is not what does society say. His question is what pleases God. Amen. Amen. So I don't even enjoy getting into conversations about 
the social implications or the legal implications or whatever. That's whatever. Yeah, does it have implications for all that? Absolutely. But my biggest concern and what I want to be yours is not social, it's theological. Amen. What pleases God? And my assumption is that we want to please him or we wouldn't be here today. Amen. Paul says you want to please him? What you do with your body matters. Holy and honorable. Now the rest of the world, like I said, doesn't make any sense to him. But why would it? Unless you have experienced the life transforming power of Jesus and know what it is to have your sins forgiven, why would you give a, a, a rip what he says? But when you know how ugly and nasty and horrible and sin-filled you've been and I've been and how God treated us in spite of that, I want to know what pleases him. Amen. Not so I can somehow gain his favor, but because I know he's already shown it to me a zillion ways that I didn't deserve it. And I want to live my life to please him. So it's important to us if we love God, we want to please him. But it's also impossible. Control your own bodies, not in, you know, passionate lust like the heathen. It's impossible. Unless we have the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Spirit of the living God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, living in me, helps me be holy in that aspect of my life. Helps you be holy in that aspect of your life. We don't have the Spirit, we're going to mess it up every time. Amen. That's right. But God gives the Spirit to empower us to do and to be everything he calls us to do and to be. And that's good news. So Paul doesn't stop there. You ready to move on? Some people are like, yeah, let's get on to something else. Let's talk about something different. All right, we will. Because the text takes us there. The next few verses, he talks about uh, brotherly love, sisterly love, the kind of uh, relationships that are happening within the church. And he, and he commends them. In fact, you read, read First Thessalonians. It's only five chapters. You should read the whole thing between now and next Sunday. It's really, it's awesome. Because he starts off in chapter one telling them how great they are. That they've turned from idols to the one true God and they're partnering with him in the gospel. And he says of them, you know, a lot of the other churches Paul writes to, it's like, you guys messing this up, you're messing that up, you better line this out. In Thessalonians, he calls them a model church. You have a reputation that is going beyond because of your love, not only for each other, but the churches in Macedonia. If I was to tell another church what do they need to look like, I'd point to Thessalonica and say, it needs to look like you guys. He's building them up. He says, so about brotherly love, I don't need to tell you that. God himself has been your teacher, and you're living it, but keep doing it and do it more. You guys know what the, uh, well, let me, let me back up a second. I don't care how long we've been walking with God. Here's the truth, because the world we live in, it's real life stuff. Let me get down here close to you. Tisha? Not everybody is easy to love. Doug, I bet you got people in your life that aren't easy to love. He smiled. <laughs> if you, I, I don't want you to call out their name, but if there was somebody that face popped into your mind when I said people not all easy to love, would you just, you know, grunt or moan or amen or do something to tell me I'm on the right track here? You know what the biggest, I, I, I wish I had I wish I'd like had this for myself, but I'm sure I read it or I stole it from somewhere. I think it was from one of my brothers. Do you know what the biggest room in the world is? You're going to like it. You're going to steal it. You're going to use it later on too. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. You're loving. You're doing a great job. You're treating each other as brothers and sisters. That's what I want you to do. Do it more. Don't get settled. Don't get satisfied. And I'm telling you, over and over and over again, God's going to put people in our life that aren't easy to love. Yes. You know why I know that? Because I know I'm not easy to love. Not too loud there. <laughs> <laughs> what we do with our bodies matters. How we treat our brothers matters. Amen. And he says that the, 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 the big picture here is that love is our law. You don't act in ways that are unloving to each other and, and think that God's going to be pleased with that. Now, the assumption is we want to please God. Now, to the rest of the world, here's the rule. Love the people that love you, hate the people that hate you. Somebody gets you, don't get, don't get mad. Don't, don't even get even. Get ahead. Right? That's the culture we live in. Here's the thing. If we will live the kind of life that we're called to and that God makes possible, we're going to look different than the rest of the world. 
If we honor God with our bodies and we say it's not all about pleasing me, it is about pleasing him, the rest of the world is going to be, that guy looks different. If we respond in love to one another, when the rest of the world says, I would find a way to, mm, you know, we're going to look different. Yes. For the people out in the world, none of this makes any sense. They're wondering, like, you know, why, why don't they own the golf? Why are they doing sitting in a church on a beautiful Sunday morning? Because it matters to us. Yes. And here's why. Because Jesus forgave us. Yes. He raised us from the dead. He gave us new life. He treated us way better than we deserve to be treated. That's why it matters. That's why it matters to me. That's why I want to please him. Not because I think pleasing him makes him love me more, but because that seems to be the only thing that makes sense to a God who's already shown how much he loves me. Yes. All right, so he goes on. I go, you remember my friend? You, you haven't forgotten a parking lot, have you? No. Remember get some coffee, James? <laughs> the last thing he said was, I know that people are watching me. My kids... The rest of the folks out there, because they know I'm a Christian. You know what Paul ends this little section of be holy, be sanctified, this is God's will for you with? The rest of the world is watching you. And they will get their idea about what kind of God we have by the kind of life you live. Can I tell you that what you do matters? Amen. That how we behave matters, what we do with our bodies matters. How we treat our brothers, it makes a difference, it matters. And how we bear witness to the world, to the kind of God we have, makes an absolute difference. Yes. How many of you have ever talked to somebody or known somebody who checked out completely from the Christian faith because they saw somebody who wasn't living it very well? That shouldn't incite fear for us, but it ought to sober us a little bit, right? Everything we do, every reaction, every interaction, somebody is going to get an idea about who God is. And I'm not telling you this because I think it needs to be this, you know, let's talk about psychology or let's talk about uh, sociology. I'm talking theology here. What pleases God is what we're after. Amen. And when we live a life together, 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 so that's how we do it, that says our primary aim is to please God. Yes. The rest of the world will see that. Will we get it right every time? Absolutely not. I've messed up lots of times. Can God redeem even our mistakes? Absolutely. Now, the rest of the world doesn't really care about that. Why should they? You can't expect people that don't know God to want to please God, right? But it matters to us. Thank you, Charlotte. It matters to us. That was a good place. It matters to us. So here's where we're at. God calls you to live a holy life. God calls me to live a holy life. Amen. It's the kind of life where the point of reference is around one thing. Not sociology, not psychology. Theology. What is it that pleases God? And the good news is we don't, we're not going into it blind. You know why? Because he told us. Amen. What you do with your bodies matters. How you treat your brothers matters. Your witness to the world matters. Live like that. Yeah. And the best news of all... He's given us everything we need to get it right. Yes. Called the Holy Spirit who lives within us, fills us, indwells us, so that every day, that work of sanctifying, making holy, God continues to work it in us. More today than he did yesterday. More tomorrow than he did today. Joe, come on up. Well, what we believe is that every time the word gets proclaimed, somehow it calls for a response. And I don't know what that needs to be for you today. Maybe, uh, maybe you've never... Maybe you've never known God. Maybe you've never known the, the reality that Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Maybe you, if you're walking around today and you don't, you're not connected with God, he loves you. I promise you that. No matter what you've done, how many times you've done it, he loves you like crazy. Amen. Maybe today the response is, I'm going to start loving him back. If you're a believer and your life has not really been reflecting the holiness that this word calls for, don't beat yourself up about it. That's yesterday. You got today. And maybe today's a start to, to embrace what God wants to do in you at a deeper level than he's ever done before. I don't know. But he wants to do something in you, I'm pretty sure. And you'll have a great day if you let him do what he wants to do. So let's all stand. We're going to sing. And as we sing, if you want to pray, you can pray at the altar. You can